Advisory Committee meeting of um, October 6th uh, to order, and it is now uh, 8.35. I want to remind everybody um, that this meeting is being recorded uh, via teleconference. I'm going to ask committee members uh, to indicate their presence uh, with a roll call. Um, so, um, Carrie, would you mind doing that roll call? No, that's, that's fine. Uh, Linda Escobedo. Uh, present. Carol Wilson. Present. Tom Piper. Present. Wendy Rovelli. Present. Court Booth. Arthur Coleman. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, the first item on the agenda is uh, approval of minutes uh, for January 30th, 2020. Uh, do I hear a second? A motion, excuse me, a motion? <laughs> uh, yes, I'll move the minutes from January 30th. Thank you, Carol. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, and um, all those in favor. And again, we need to uh, call a roll uh, call for this. Indy Rovelli. Uh, approve. Tom Piper. Approve. Carol Wilson. Approve. Linda Escobedo. Um, I was going to abstain because I was not present at that meeting. Okay. And, and here's Arthur. Hello, hello. Sorry to be late. Uh, we're just taking a, a vote. Good morning. We're just taking a vote on the minutes uh, do you, uh, and a motion. I do. You, you approve. Okay. I do. Thank you. All right. Um, so that is for uh, approve and one abstention, um, and the chair so declares. So we'll move now to the second agenda item, which is the FY19 um, Concord Carlisle Regional School District final audit and management letter. And um, I want to well, welcome this morning, as we already have, um, Scott McIntyre from Mellison Heath and Company, and uh, have him walk us through this. And Scott, um, if you don't mind, if you could just comment initially about how the timeline compares to when you might have been doing this previously. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's a, again, forgive me with some, some technical difficulties this morning, but I switched uh, to a conference room and uh, happy to be here this morning to walk you through uh, our audit of Concord Carlisle Regional School Districts. Um, also, uh, you see online is Zachary Fentross. Um, he's uh, managed the uh, municipal light plan audit, which is next on, on your agenda. Um, just in terms to address the, the, the chair's question, uh, th th I think there's probably a really good chance uh, that this meeting would have taken place um, April or May um, of, or earlier this calendar year. Um, our audit of the school district uh, went very well. Um, in, in, uh, and really what that means is we found the books and records to be in good working order. Uh, we issued our opinion on the financial statements back, um, all the way back in March uh, of this calendar year. Um, and if it wasn't for, for COVID, we probably would have, as I indicated, have had this meeting in, um, in April or, or perhaps in May, which would have also kicked off uh, the towns and school districts June 30, 2020 engagement. Um, I guess I would uh, add one more thing to that. Um, and that is that if we, as an audit firm, thought there was something this committee absolutely needed to, to know about as a result of the, of the audit, uh, I, I think we would have contacted Carrie and, 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 and done what we could to um, see if a Zoom meeting couldn't have taken place back, back in the springtime. Uh, but as I indicated before, our audit of your financial statements went, went very well. And while this communication is, is really necessary and critical, uh, we didn't think the results of the audit, they certainly didn't disclose anything that we thought really needed to be brought to the committee's attention back back in the, in, in the springtime. I can assure you, though, had there been anything discovered in our examination of the school district's financial statements that we thought should have come to the committee's attention um, earlier than this, we, we, would have, we, we would have done so. I've said that on, in several meetings this, this, uh, in, as the summer ended and, and, and the fall started. Um, it's a little bit strange doing a, to talking about an audit from June 3019. Um, here it is in October of 2020. Uh, but I've actually, both Zach and I have done a fair amount of it in the last few months. So it's becoming a little bit norm, but uh, hopefully it won't uh, continue to be the norm. 
and we don't think that it will. With that said, uh, just to get through, walking through the financial statements of the school district, um, I know that the chair is new, um, maybe just a, a little bit of a, a setting. The, 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 in, a, in a governmental set of financial statements, there is both a, a long-term perspective and a short-term perspective. We call them technically, they're called the government-wide financial statements. That includes all of the school district's long-term capital assets, all of the long-term liabilities such as uh, you know, bonds payable, uh, uh, your net pension liability, and the net OPEP liability, which we'll talk a little bit about. After that, we'll come to the fund financial statements, which is really, it, it, it's technically, it's called the modified accrual basis, but it's a lot, it's, it's very similar to cash. And, and that's a balance sheet and presentation that is often looked at as how are we doing today without, without factoring in the long-term assets and, and, and long-term liabilities. I think what we're gonna see when we walk through here from a long-term perspective, uh, there's, a, there's a dip in the unrestricted uh, net position of the school district really driven by one factor, and that is your, your, your increase in your net OPEB liability. We can talk more about that um, as the conversation continues. And on the fund level, you're going to see you know, things stay relatively stable uh, in the school district uh, from a fund perspective and, and, and a, also a government-wide perspective is in good fi financial position. But before we get into some of the numbers, uh, first in the financial statements, and it's our understanding you have a couple of documents that were put out in, in the agenda. Uh, there's the financial statements and the management letter. I want to talk for a few minutes about the financial statements and then we'll hop into the management letter. Um, starting on page one and it goes over to page two as it's titled, it's our independent auditor's report on your basic financial statements. It tells you the uh, audit standards that we followed. We followed all the applicable uh, auditing, sta auditing standards, those promulgated by the AICPA or the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, as well as government auditing standards. And based on the procedures we've performed, uh, our opinion is that your financial statements are materially consistent with generally accepted accounting principles in all respects. It's not news. The school districts had this type of an opinion for, for, for a long time, uh, but it is sort of the highlight of the audit that um, you know, your, your financial statements are presented uh, completely in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles for local governments here in the United States. Following that is page three through nine, which is your management's discussion and analysis. It's a great resource to go back to at a later point in time to understand why certain key account balances may have changed uh, during fiscal year 2019. And then after that really starts with uh, the, the, the number pages of, of the financial statements. Page 10 and 11 um, are what I referred to earlier as, as the government-wide financial statements. It's uh, on a full accrual basis of accounting, much like a business would pre pre present their financial statements. Uh, and as I indicated before, it includes all the long-term capital assets of, of the school district, as well as the long-term liabilities, bonds payable, uh, net OPEP liability, and, and, and those types of things. Again, page 10, one column of numbers. The first place that most readers are going to turn is that second number up from the bottom or your unrestricted uh, net position. It's in parentheses indicating that the liabilities outweigh the assets by about $16.5 million. Uh, that's very much driven by, by, by two transactions. One is your net pension liability and the other is your net OPEB liability. And if you look a couple inches up from the bottom uh, of, of page 10, you'll see those, um, the, the net pension liability and the net OPEB liability. And just as a reminder, in case it's needed, OPEB stands for other post-employment benefits. And what, it, what is really meant by other is it's other liabilities, other li long-term liabilities other than pension. In a nutshell, it means retiree health insurance and the liability associated with providing uh, uh, retirees and, and future retirees uh, a health care liability upon re retirement. Collectively, about $17, $18 million in those two liabilities. Many readers would look at this uh, pay, page 10 and see the, the second number up from the bottom and as 16 million in parentheses and, and note that the, uh, those two liabilities that we've spoken about is on almost 17, almost $17 million. And so it's those liabilities, those long-term liabilities that turn the unrestricted net position to a negative. Now to put that in perspective though, because it really is important to put it in perspective. Uh, the school district is a, I think is all on the call know, is a member of the Concord Regional Retirement System. 
It's a very well-funded system, particularly in, in, uh, in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So school district carrying a, a 4.7 or almost $4.8 million net pension liability, uh, that is much lower than most school districts in the Commonwealth of, of, of Massachusetts. So I just wanted to add that perspective. Similarly, with the OPEB liability, uh, it's about $12 million, and there was a significant increase in that liability from 18 to, to 19. Again, to put it in perspective, um, the school district is, ha has an OPEB plan, and it started to, to fund that liability. Uh, and again, comparing it with other school districts in the Commonwealth, that liability is, is moderate compared to mo most school districts that we, that we do uh, audit work for. Um, I mentioned that that net OPEB liability went up significantly over the prior year. It's all in the notes, I'm not necessarily going to turn to the, to the uh, key pages in the notes, but the one uh, assumption that really drove the change in that liability was uh, an increase to what is known as the healthcare trend rate. I think it went from about eight and a half percent in the first year to nine and a half percent as the anticipated increase uh, in health healthcare costs, which significantly drove that that uh, that liability upwards. Now that increasing that liability, if you turn to the next page, page eleven, this is your statement of activities, um, and if you look in that way over, um, almost in the bottom right hand corner, the third number up from the bottom, you see your change in net position for your governmental activities went down by $823,000. That decrease in your net position is driven by the fact that as that liability for your net pension, uh, net OPEB liability goes up, your ex the, the OPEB expense goes up as well, and it drives this into a reduction in your net, pos net position. Um, it's widely expected that um, under the, the accounting standards that drive the treatment for both net pension liability and the net OPEB liability, that there can be significant changes from year to year. So it is possible that you'll see uh, a reversing effect in, in future years based on changes of assumptions and things like that. So with that said, if I could turn your attention over to page 12. Um, page 12, even though uh, the, the, the government-wide financial statements have been around for a long time now, page 12 is really the first place that most readers are going to turn to uh, in, in, in the school district's financial statements. And they're going to focus on that first column of numbers, or the general fund, and even more so, the third number up from the bottom, or your unassigned fund balance with an account balance as of June 30, 2019, of about $1.4 million. Uh, that's often viewed as, as the available dollars for the, for the school district. Uh, I think you have to dig a little bit deeper into the financial statements before you, we could conclude on that a little bit. Uh, but I will would want to point out that that $1.4 million is, is a, a represents an increase of about $450,000 over the, uh, the unassigned fund balance of June 30, 2018. Uh, and that increase of about $450,000 is really driven uh, by two things, uh, favorable budgetary results of operations, which we'll look at in a moment. And um, one of the uh, other key things that goes into that change is that only about $350,000 of your uh, E&D uh, was used as, as of June 30, 19, only about $350,000 of your E&D was used towards the FY20 um, bu budget cycle. So those are the really the two main things that go into uh, the $400,000 increase in your unassigned fund balance. Um, if I could, last page before I get into the, into the management letter, if I could turn your attention over to page uh, 16. Page 16 is your, your budget and actual comparative schedule. Uh, and the focus here is gonna be on that final column on the right-hand side of, of page 16, uh, which represents the, the variances or the difference between the actual results of operation uh, and, and the, the, the budgeted uh, or the anticipated results of operations, which was the budget. Um, and from the top down, uh, you see that there was about $613,000 total in revenues that came in greater than expected. There was, those involved some dis, uh, additional state revenues, um, some, some interest revenue was greater than anticipated, uh, and some miscellaneous revenues came in about $150,000 greater than expected. On the expenditure side, uh, about two thirds of the way down on the last column on page 16, you see that there are unspent appropriations of total expenditures 
of just over $191,000. Uh, that number is very consistent with the prior year and uh, is certainly uh, is, is not uncommon to see in, in school districts uh, that where there's, you know, turnbacks or unspent appropriations, which are only a very small percentage of, of the budget. So the combination of that 600,000 in favorable revenues and the $191,000 uh, in unspent appropriations, sometimes referred to as turnbacks, it uh, gives you the next number down on, on the last column of page 16, or you see the, the, the total of $804,000. That's generally going to be referred to as the, the budgetary results of operations for fiscal year uh, 2019. I almost said 20, because we're, in, we're, <laughs> we're into 20 audits. So for, if I make that mistake, Zach will correct me, I'm sure. Uh, so the 800,000 is generally thought of as your uh, favorable budgetary results of operations for fiscal 19. Um, and I, when we were looking at the balance sheet, I also mentioned that uh, the school district used uh, $350,000 of, it, of its E&D uh, as of June 30, 2019 for the subsequent fiscal year or fiscal year 20. So if you take that $800,000 and subtract what you used towards next year of $350,000, you get about $450,000. It's not going to work out exactly, uh, but it comes very, very close and it, and it should. The favorable results of operations of $800,000 softened by the fact that you used $350,000 of it gives you a net result of about $450,000 which drives the increase in your unassigned fund balance back on your fund basis that balance sheet. One more point of reference, and uh, if you don't have to, but uh, if committee members choose to, back on page seven of your MD MDNA, it's just a little comparative schedule that, that shows the unassigned fund balance uh, this year and last year and shows a $450,000 increase. Also would note that the unassigned fund balance as of June 19, represents uh, a little bit under 4% of, uh, of the operating expenditures of, of the school district. And statutorily by Massachusetts general law, the school district is capped um, at having a 5% unassigned fund balance. Uh, so you're certainly within that, um, that parameter. Uh, excuse me, this is um, Linda. Um, well, if I may interrupt you uh, while we're on this page, under the uh, governmental activities under other? Yes. Uh, what might be included in that? This is just to confirm you're on page seven, Linda? Correct. Um, I would have to look that up. Um, okay. I, I just don't know, but it, it, it could be, particularly since it's a, 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 a negative number, which means that it's probably an expense that, that was uh, recognized by, by the district. There are perspective differences, uh, and one of those is in your fund basis financial statements, you don't recognize an interest expense until it's paid. But on the government-wide financial statements, it uses the full accrual basis of accounting. You, 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 you make an adjustment for your accrued interest payable. I have a suspicion, I'll have to confirm this, but I have a suspicion that a, a large part of that 154, almost $155,000 is, is an accrued interest uh, liability or interest expense on you know, over $50 million, almost you know, $54 million in bonds payable. So, but I'll confirm that and uh, get that answer to carry for distribution to the committee. Yeah, thank you. I generally don't get down in the weeds, but um, that just struck me. So thank you. I, it's a great question. Um, generally, we see it when, it's, when it is negative, we get asked that question. If it's 154 positive, we typically won't, don't get that, that, yeah. that question. But it's a great, great question. Um, that's a very, very quick overview of, of, of the school district's June 30, 2018, uh, pardon me, 2019 financial statements. Included in your packet also was uh, our, our management letter. A uh, couple of things I'll, I'll go quickly here because um, I know we've got some time constraints and we need to get into uh, CMLP. Uh, in the district's management letter, uh, there's, there's, we have four comments in here. Uh, two are current year recommendations and, and, and two are in, informational comments. Uh, starting on page three, but I, I would encourage you at, one point, at some point in time to read the introductory letter. It tells you a little bit about what we, what we did and um, the fact that our, our audit was based on, on sample sampling, uh, statistically sound sampling, uh, but it's not as if we looked at every transaction going through the books and records. Um, but we do have a couple of recommendations. Uh, the first one, again, at the top of page three of the school district's management letter. 
uh, is to improve the accounting for the notes payable liability and the activity of that. Uh, the school district wasn't using its general ledger to track uh, the, the, the bonds in the, in the bond anticipation notes and a, a very normal uh, uh, type of transaction associated with financing projects first with notes and then converting them to, to bonds is that there is a pay down of the bond anticipation note. And in, given the fact that the school district was tracking all of this stuff just on spreadsheets and not in the, in the general ledger, uh, it was really missing a pay down. It was, everything was, cash was fine, the recognition of all the revenue and expenditures, but the, the, the treatment of the pay down of the bond anticipation note wasn't uh, reflected in the general ledger in a manner that is consistent with generally accepted accounting pr principles. Uh, so we're recommending that you uh, enhance the general ledger or the use of the general ledger to track the, the bond anticipation notes and the long-term uh, bonds. It will improve the current practice uh, and it will uh, just continue to bring the, the school district's general ledger to, to um, you know, full generally accepted accounting principles. And the second issue on, at the bottom of, of page three is to improve the accounting for year-end accounts payable. Another way to look at this is just to, is, is to perhaps uh, do a better job of distinguishing between an accounts payable and an encumbrance. They're two very different things and they mean, and, and from a budgetary standpoint, I'm, they're, they're very, very similar on a budgetary basis. But from a generally accepted accounting principles perspective, they're very different and you need to track them both on a budgetary basis and on a gap or generally accepted accounting principles. So some additional distinction needs to be made in the accounting system uh, to identify things, one as payable and two as, as encumbrances. It will really um, strengthen the general ledger and, and the cutoff, uh, a year end cutoff will be much more enhanced with some more, more attention being paid to the distinguishing between accounts payable and, and, uh, and encumbrances. Over on page four, I'll touch briefly on items number three and number four uh, to, as one. Some, some new standards are coming out that the school district, uh, I know they're aware of. Um, and I actually, um, given so sub, subsequent to the publication of, of, of this management letter, uh, like so many things in our world today, things have been pushed back. Um, th they're originally these two accounting standards that the school district is, is challenged with, with facing were going to be applicable for FY20, which we're in. Actually, we're out of FY20. Um, and, and then the second one, GASB 87, was going to be 20, FY21. Uh, but like so many things, as I indicated, the GASB issued a new standard which said, let's put everything back a year. It was a little more complicated than that, but in essence, they've deferred implementation of, of, of many of their standards uh, an extra year. Um, stakeholders really want, you know, they were, they were tackled with trying to uh, deal with the pandemic in the springtime and, and get their books in order with what was coming. Um, and they begged GASB to defer implementation, particularly of, of Statement 84. It's not one that should be taken lightly. Um, there's a lot of issues in that standard. It uh, deals not only with student activity fund, but the treatment of uh, inflows and outflows associated, uh, you know, perhaps between the school district and, and the town, there will be some attention uh, that is needed to be paid to how some of those transactions are, are treated. 87 is with, deals with leases. It's a couple years, years away, uh, but, it, but don't sleep on that one either uh, as, um, there's, a, there's potentially a, a significant amount of work to do in, in that area as well. That's a very, very quick walkthrough of, of our audit of your financial statements, of the district's financial statements. And as I indicated at the top, um, the, the timing of this is, is a little bit late, uh, but I, it normally would have occurred uh, in, in April, May. Uh, and I assure you that if there was something that we thought was um, critical that the audit committee know about, we would have uh, been, been found a way, uh, even, in, even in April, May, when things were even crazier than they are right now, we would have found a way to have this meeting to communicate uh, or to make the required communication with, with, you, with you folks. So with Thank that said, you. I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there questions from the committee? Wendy. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Sorry, my mouse wasn't cooperating. Um, 
Just okay. a quick question. I think it's probably for Jared. Um, on that page 16 that we were looking at, there was about a million and $550,000 of expenditures for out of district programs that over budget. Can you just tell us what, what was that special education? What was that? My apologies, right when you started, somebody came into my office and I said, they're gonna call me, watch this. And sure enough, <laughs> can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, on page 16 under the expenditures, looking at um, actual versus budget, there was um, $550,000 over budget on out of district programs. And I was just curious, yep. uh, that special ed, what was, what, that's, that's a lot of money, I was wondering what it was. That is, uh, in my connection might be uh, poor, I apologize. So it has to do with, and, and Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, this, from, this is from 19, but it has to do with putting monies in circuit breaker and other revolving accounts and then charging, charging it back. So what we can do is, is we can increase our circuit breaker rollover. So what we do is we, we charge more to the general fund at the end of the year if we have extra money, which would allow us to have a higher contingency in circuit breaker, by law, we're allowed to have, um, we're allowed to get, uh, carry over the, the amount that we get that current fiscal year, and we have to expend that at least for the next fiscal year. So if we say we got a hundred, uh, we got a million dollars in FY19, we can carry over a million dollars but in FY20, if we only got $900,000, we would have to at least expend that million dollars and or at least 100,000 of that million dollars and have that minimum or maximum of 900. Um, so Ian, is that the, um, I think that's the reason why it went over. Yeah, exactly. Because the other, you can see all the other lines, all the other um, numbers on there are all positive. We decided to um, charge more circuit breaker tuitions to the general fund than the circuit breaker revolving fund. So again, yeah, it helps to increase our contingencies at the end of the year. Okay. Any other questions? Numbers on They're all positive. We decided to um, charge more circuit breaker tuitions to the general fund than the circuit breaker revolving fund. So again, yeah, it helps to increase our contingencies at the end of the year. Okay. That was a Zoom malfunction. <laughs> um, and, and just so you know, um, the I can the tuitions have, at least in my three years here, have gone down. So I I can say pretty confidently that our um, the budgeted amount we spent less than our budgeted amount uh, since Ruth Groovy, director of uh, special ed, has come in. Our tuitions uh, have gone down, creating more programs, bringing more kids in. Good, thank you. We're, we are having some technical difficulties here, so we'll try to All right, so I, I'm going to try to move to Wendy at this point. Yeah, Linda, and maybe this is just a, a question. On the summary page, um, I'm forgetting which page it is, there was a big increase in the deferred inflows of resources, and I don't know if that relates to the policies you were talking about earlier, but um, I just didn't know what was behind that. Uh, just to clarify, are you looking at page 10, Wendy? Actually, it's, well, it relates to that, but on page five, you had a summary of it, but then gets to the details, I think some of the details, but it didn't have the prior year uh, comparison on page 10. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're asking about the approximate million dollars in the deferred yeah. inflows of resources from 1.5 to 2.5. Yep. yep. Um, that, that deals with, and I'll, I'll have to look up if it's pension or OPEB, and it may okay. very well be a combination of, of the two. Okay. When there are assumption changes or in, in, um, in the valuation process, I mentioned one is uh, the healthcare trend rate. Um, yeah. I'm going to use some general terminology here. It won't be to the letter of the standard, but uh, the, the effect of that transaction is going to get amortized in over, on average, five years. It's not a hard number. Uh, okay. And so if 
the assumption change that I spoke about, um, you know, like 20% of that transaction is going to hit going to hit expense, pension or OPEB expense in the current year. The other 80% is a deferred inflow, or it could be a deferred outflow, which would be recognized in the in the subsequent four years. Okay. Does that help? I can go into it a little bit more. No, it makes sense. I mean, you've commented about health insurance uh, going up a whole percentage, so that makes some sense. Okay, thank you. Um, any other committee questions at this point? If not, uh, thank you very much. And I think we're ready to move on to the um, next audit management letter for CMLP. Scott. Uh, thank you again. I'm going to actually let uh, Zach do, do most of the speaking here, uh, but um, maybe it's a good opportunity for me to just um, share with the committee the, the packet that went to the committee included the, the draft financial statements uh, that uh, we had prepared in conjunction with, uh, with Matt and the, and the folks over at, over at CMLP. Um, we thought it, we, Carrie and I thought it might be best uh, and, and perhaps even just a little bit less confusing to, to have those drafts be the ones that get talked about today. Were, however, they, the, the financial statements and the management letter have been finalized. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Carrie, the, uh, the finance director will or has forwarded the final product to the committee. Uh, there was one adjustment though between the financial statements uh, in, in draft form and in, in final form. And when Zach walks through them, he'll, he'll point it out. Uh, it was an additional accounts payable that was found in a, in a test that we do. We call it a, a search for unrecorded li li liabilities. And so when he walks through the financial statements, he'll point out the, the couple of numbers that were, were changed uh, from the document that you have in front of you. Uh, in, in essence, accounts payable go up a little bit and your unrestricted net position goes down a little bit. It's almost like the when I was talking about the school district's financial statements, the pension liability goes up, you, in unrestricted net position goes down. The same really is true with any liability, and Zach will talk about that when he, when he walks through it. Uh, but again, the, the statements that, that were part of your package were, were the draft financial statements. They have since been finalized uh, and, and, and published, uh, and Zach will point out where in the report that they were, there was one, uh, one adjustment. So Zach, take it away. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so as Scott said, my name is Zach Ventross. I was the audit manager in charge of the light department's two thirds, light plants 2019 calendar year audit. Um, another note uh, to make uh, before I jump into the, the financial statements is that um, in the prior year, the financial statements, they were re not reported on a comparative basis. And this was due uh, to a recommendation from the AICPA due to the implementation of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 75. Since the Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 75 has now been implemented for two years, the financial statements are again uh, reported on a comparative basis. So uh, it'll be very similar to Scott in some respects. So if I could have you turn to the first page after the table of contents. This is the Independent Auditor's Report. Um, this is the first page of that report. The plant received the clean opinion, which again is the best opinion you can receive from an independent auditors, which is the same opinion that the plant has received in prior years. If you could next turn to page four, which is the first page of the management discussion and analysis. And this takes place on pages four through seven. Again, like Scott said, this is a pretty useful area where they talk about some key changes from uh, between the fiscal years but I think it's a little bit easier for this presentation purposes to jump right into the number pages. So if I could have you turn to page eight, which is the consolidated statement of net position. And the reason I say consolidated is that this is actually a combination of the light plant and the broadband activities. And a breakout of what was light and what was broadband can actually be seen on pages 36 through 38. I don't want to jump there now. We will jump there at the end of the presentation of the financial statements, but I wanted to make you aware that this is both the combination of light and broadband. So like Scott said, um, the statement in that position is, is going to include both the long-term assets and long-term liabilities. 
for the light plant, there is no short term presentation. There is only going to be a full accrual basis presentation for the light and the broadband consolidated financial statements. So I'd like to bring your attention on, on page eight to a few of the items that you know had changes that were fairly significant from one year to the next. And the first one is about a third of the way down the page. It is landing construction in progress and then other capital assets net of accumulated depreciation. This represents the, the light plants and the broadband's uh, capital assets. And there was a, uh, they, they had about $3.2 million in, in capital asset uh, additions this year. That was softened by about $2 million in depreciation expenses, which is why you don't see that, that full increase in that asset. And some of the larger additions this year were $784,000 for infrastructure improvements, which consisted of new lights and a new conduit. And then there was $343,000 for new computer and software equipment. And then finally, there was $268,000 spent on new vehicles. The next item I want to bring to your attention is under liabilities. It's maybe two thirds of the way down the page. And that is the first one under non current which is bond payables net of current position, which had a balance of 4,261,000. This is actually a decrease of about 265,000 from the prior year. And what I wanted to bring to your attention here is that there were new bonds that were issued in calendar year 2019 for 510,000. Of that 510,000, 338 was for broadband, and then 172,000 was for light for some land acquisition purposes. What's key to note here is that 100% of this debt will be paid off within the next nine years. And this is going to be viewed favorably by the users of the financial statements. Users really like to see that debt will be uh, by about 70 to 75% of the debt paid off in 10 years. So to have 100% of your debt paid off in nine years, again, is going to be viewed very favorably by the users of your financial statements. The next item I want to bring to your attention is actually right below bonds payable. It's the next line item called net pension liability. And this represents the light department or the light plants portion of the total unfunded liability for the Concord, Concord con con Contributory Retirement System. Excuse me. And that portion the, the, of, of uh, that total portion is about 10%. What's key to note here is that this presentation is as of December 31st of 2018. So it's about a year or almost two years in, in, in arrears. So this is not, the, the, the net pension liability is not as of December 31st of 19, it's as of December 31st of 18. Now, as you can see, there was actually a fairly large increase in that liability, an increase by about $2.6 million in calendar year 2019. And that was primary in, in 2000, it's 2019 presentation, but the liability as of December 31st of 18. And that's primarily due to the investment results of the retirement system being less than what was anticipated in 2018. So the investment results for the retirement system came in about $18.3 million less than what was anticipated in 2018. And about 1.8 million of that can be attributable to the light department. So that's why you see that large increase in that liability is due to the uh, investment results, again, coming in less than what was anticipated by the, uh, by the retirement system in calendar year 2018. Uh, just to reiterate what Scott had said earlier, the system is very well funded. It's at about 81% funded, which is, again, higher than, than the average we see in the Commonwealth. Say the average in the Commonwealth is anywhere between 65 to 70 percent. So again, to have a system that's 81% funded will be viewed favorably by uh, the users of the financial statements. And Zach, just if I may, uh, absolutely. the 81% is again, just to, because I do think it's really important. It's as of 12-31-18, right? That is correct. Which is just the measurement date for this, for this. again, we're talking about 12-31-19 financial statements, but that liability as, as is permissible in the standards is measured a year earlier, so. And, and the only other thing I would want to point out, because the question came up uh, when I was talking about the school district, and it maybe with the benefit of a, a few minutes here and, 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 and listening, I have a, another way to, the, the question came up about the increase. I think it was Carol, you asked about the increase in the uh, deferred inflow or deferred outflow. As Zach was saying, this net pension liability went up about $2 million. Well, if you look at about a third of the way down from the page, you see deferred outflows of resources related to pensions. You see that went up about $2 million. That's, there's that definite relationship between the increase 
in the liability in the increase in the, in the deferral. That again, roughly speaking, 20% of that change get, gets recognized as, as an income statement or an expense in the current year and 80% of it gets deferred to uh, future periods. So, thanks, Zach. Thank you, Scott. The line item right below that of for the net pension liability is the net OPEB liability. And as Scott said earlier, OPEB stands for other post-employment benefits. Excuse me. And that actually has a balance of 2385000 which is about a $40,000 increase in the prior. It's pretty consistent. But what I wanted to bring to your attention here uh, is, is that this plan is about 35% funded as of June 30, 2019. That is very comparable to other like departments in the Commonwealth. I see the average anywhere between 20 and 40%. So it, it might be, you could consider it maybe on the higher end uh, compared to like departments in the Commonwealth. Uh, for, for your contemporaries, but that is a, a good, strong position for the light department to be in to have a 30% funded uh, other post-employment benefits trust fund. Uh, generally speaking, most towns are, are anywhere between one and seven to 10%. Uh, light departments tend to be a little bit higher, so at, at 35% is, is a, again, a strong position for uh, the light department to have. So Scott had mentioned that, um, and I'm sorry I didn't bring this up when I, when I first got to this page, that there was a change between the draft that uh, you folks are, here, are looking at here and, and what was finalized. And the change is going to be on the accounts payable, as Scott had mentioned. Uh, so the, the figure that you're looking at is about $2.8 million in that 2019 column. Well, in the final, it's actually about $3.5, $3.4 million. And that's about a $640,000 increase. And again, as Scott had said, we had performed, uh, you know, finished off our testing and it came to our attention that there was a purchase power expense that was uh, not accrued for properly. Uh, so, and, and Matt had agreed with us and, and that adjustment was made both on uh, in the financial statements and in the lights uh, general ledger uh, to reflect the proper accounting treatment for that. So, as you see, the accounts payable went up by about 640,000. And then the second number from the bottom, that unrestricted net position, that actually went down by about 640,000 from the, the draft that you folks are looking at to what was ultimately finalized. And the last thing I'd like to bring to your attention is we do, a, it's an analysis that we do with all of our light departments. It's essentially a quick ratio. We like to take the very first two numbers on this um, statement in that position, which is your cash plus your accounts receivable, less your accounts payable, which is about halfway down the page, and then compare that to one month's average of the, your operating expenditures. And generally what we like to see is uh, a ratio of about three uh, or above three. So about three months worth of uh, current uh, assets, less your current liabilities to, to just to compare to what would be the average month or, or an average of one month of operating expenditures. So if you turn to the next page, actually page nine, about halfway down the page, you see the total operating expenditures. We basically just take that, divide it by 12, and compare that to uh, the, again, the accumulation of your, your cash, plus your accounts payable, less your, um, excuse me, your, your accounts receivable, less your accounts payable. And again, we like to see that at about three. And in this year, it was 2.29, and that's down from 2.6 in 2018. So, um, again, speaking with, to, to your contemporaries, 2.29, that is a, 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 a good position uh, for the department to be in. Again, we like to recommend and, and uh, see it towards three, but 2.29 is, is, is a good position for the, uh, the department to be in. That concludes everything I want to bring to your attention on the statement of net position. If we could turn to page nine, which is the statement of changes in net position. And what I'll start with here is again, talking about that change from the draft that you folks are looking at to, to what was finalized, uh, maybe about a third of the way down the page under the first item under operating expenditures is purchase power. And that has a balance of 19,128,000. That's going to increase by about 640,000 so the final figure is actually closer to what was uh, on the finals is 19,770,000. And likewise, the change in net position, um, which is three numbers from the bottom, and it balances 
$285,000. It's now actually a deficit of $354,000 with the, that, that, all that uh, change between the draft and the final. What I wanted to bring to your attention here is the first two are, are kind of related. And it's the very first line item, it's electric sales. And that is a balance of 25,825,000. It's actually a decrease of about 353,000. And then that, I would like to talk about that one in conjunction with the purchase power expenditures, which is the first line item under operating expenditures. They both were decreasing the current year. They were both down compared to 2018. And that was primarily due to a decrease in the cost of purchase power. And that decrease in the cost of the purchase power is passed on to the customers of the plant. So it costs less money to purchase the electricity in the power of fiscal and calendar year 2019. And that decrease in that cost was passed along to the customers of the light plant. And again, you can see that decrease in, in the electric sales as well. <clears throat> The next one item I'd like to bring to your attention is actually four numbers from the top. It's renewable energy certificate surcharge, and that has a balance of 1,642,000. It's about a $1.1 million increase from the prior year. And this relates to uh, something that the plant did, in, it began doing in September of 2018. The plant began charging customers a rate for renewable energy certificates. So in 2018, that represents uh, charges to customers only from September through December of 2018. Whereas in that 2019 column, it's for the full year of those uh, uh, charges to your customers. So that's why you see such a large increase in that revenue account is because this now represents a full year of those renewable energy certificate surcharges to the customers of the uh, Concord Municipal Light Plant. And if I could have you turn to page 36, this is everything I want to bring to your attention on the uh, statement of changes in net position. And on page 36, this is the breakdown of the uh, consolidating statement of net position. And I think that there's a, an item here that I want to bring to your attention because it's going to relate to the management letter. So we see there, there's you know, quite a few columns here, but I want to focus just on the 2019 side. You can see that there's the light fund, the broadband fund, and then any eliminations, and then the total. About maybe a third of the way down the page, you can see due from broadband on the light fund. And then it's also, if you look over to the elimination fund, it's fully eliminated out for that $1.8 million. That $1.8 million represents, um, all right, let me take a step back. Uh, it, it represents some uh, funds that are due from the broadband to the light department because to date the revenue for the broadband has not generated enough revenues to cover the cash flows for the functions of broadband. And as a result, broadband has had to borrow funds from the light fund operations uh, to fund their capital. And as of December 31st, 2019, that amount borrowed from light plant for broadband was about $1.8 million. And I think that relates and in, in comes right into our, our um, management letter. So if I could have you turn to the management letter, I may go a little out of order on the management letter just because we just spoke about that $1.8 million. So on the management letter, if we turn to page three, here are the two recommendations uh, for the calendar year 2019 audit. And number two is to formalize a loan agreement between light and broadband. Essentially what we're saying here is that there's no formal repayment terms or agreement between light and broadband on how to pay back that $1.8 million. So we're just recommending that there be a formal approved agreement between light and broadband for the repayment of those items. And in speaking with Matt, the uh, light plant and the broadband does have a draft of that agreement, but due to COVID and, and you know, things taking priority, it got pushed to the back burner, but I do, in speaking with Matt, that is a priority for the light plant, and they do expect to have that um, uh, completed in that agreement completed here in the near future. Matt, I don't know if you wanted to uh, take this opportunity to speak to that. Uh, sure. Hello, I'm Matt Cummings. Um, the, uh, we, we were actually going to present this to the select board or the, um, to the uh, light board uh, right before COVID hit, and then it, so that that kind of derailed our plan. So uh, we've had the we've had the agreement written up. We just need to present it to the board and, and get it approved. So 
That should happen shortly. And just it's Wendy, just to point out, I think Dave did bring this to the board's attention. Um, but to your point, we haven't formalized it, but he did uh, give a status report to the light board that this was an issue that they were going to work on. And then on page three, the um, moving up to the first comment is to document cash reconciliations with the town of Concord. And we, and we did classify this as a significant deficiency uh, that a plant has not had a significant deficiency in years past. So um, essentially, there has been a delay in the cash reconciliation process between the light plant and um, the town of Concord. Um, and, and we didn't receive a, a cash reconciliation until early September of 2020 for December 31st of 2019, almost nine months after year end. And in speaking with plant management, a reconciliation hadn't been done in almost 20 months. Uh, the last reconciliation that had been done was December 31st of 2018. Um, in, in, in speaking with Matt, we, we, we are aware that there are some challenges uh, when it comes to that reconciliation process. Um, but from our perspective, we think that 20 months is, is a bit much to have with, without a cash reconciliation between the light plan uh, and, and the town's general ledger. Um, just so for, for you folks here that, that you may not be aware, the light plant doesn't actually have custody over their cash. The custody is within uh, the town. So the town treasurer maintains custody over the light department's cash. And then there is a reconciliation uh, that should be being performed between the general ledger for the light plant and the general ledger for the town to make sure that the two of those uh, agree. And again, that hadn't been performed in almost 20 months, uh, but we did ultimately get it from Matt uh, for December 31st of 2019 in early, early September uh, of, of 2020. And at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair. That's everything that I wanted to bring uh, to this committee's attention for both the management letter and the financial statements. Thank you, Zach. You're welcome. Are there any questions from the committee? One oh, question. If, sorry. I, the issue about the uh, compliance with the rate, allowable rate of return, uh, did, did that come up as an issue? Are we in compliance? Do we check for compliance? Yes, the, the department is in compliance. So again, for you, for the folks that may not be aware, there is a 8% rate of return uh, um, ceiling essentially uh, that's established by the Department of Public Utilities in the Commonwealth. And the starting point for that calculation is actually the capital assets for the plant. And it's taken at gross, not net. So the gross um, capital assets for the plant was $70 million. You take 8% of that, just a quick calculation, it's about 5.6 million, which means that the net income can't exceed $5.6 million. And um, net income was 285,000 on the draft that you folks are looking at, and it's at actually a deficit for uh, the final. So the, the plant was certainly in compliance with that 8% rate of return requirement with the DPU in fiscal year 2019. And I just wanna uh, state that if the plant were to exceed that 8% rate of return in a given year, that's okay. Um, in the Department of Public Utilities starts to um, may, may consider dropping the rates of the plant if that 8% rate of return is, is exceeded in multiple fis uh, 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 succession, in fiscal years in succession. And again, one fiscal year, they're not going to be uh, considering dropping the rates. Uh, but if it was a, a something that happened year after year, they would probably drop the rates of the plant. But to, to ultimately answer your question, uh, the plant was definitely in compliance uh, with that 8% rate of return in, fis in calendar year 2019. Does that include broadband in the calculation? Yes, it does. So people on the utility front could be paying high rates, in fact, uh, but it, it doesn't show up because we're conducting a startup operation with heavy expenses up front. I'm not sure I understand uh, the question or, or point you were trying to make there. Is the regulatory, is the 8%, we're so far away it doesn't matter, but uh, does the 8% include uh, all operations or only the electric utility? That is a good question. I'm not sure if broadband is um, required to be in line with 8%. Matt, do you know the answer to that question? 
whenever I calculate it, I take the light, I take the broadband out of the calculation. I can certainly reach out to the Department of Public Utilities. That is a very good question, whether or not the broadband should be included with that calculation. Uh, certainly, as you said, that there's not an issue in, in, in calendar year 19, but that's not to say that that might not come up in calendar year 22, 23, or 24. So I think that's good to have uh, everybody here be on the same page with whether or not that's a requirement as well. I can certainly reach out to the DPU on that one. Thank you, Tom and Zach. Uh, Wendy. So I'm wondering, the cash receivables is something that's been on the slate like many years in a row. And part of the issue had been that we were implementing a new billing system. So I'm wondering if Matt can just update the team here about what the accomplishments are. And I, I know COVID has um, confounded that process, but can you speak to that, Matt, just so the board's aware, this committee's aware? Yeah, I, I think the, the bigger issue is the new, the new system, trying to get familiar with that. And then that kind of slowed the process of almost all of our processes down. Um, on, and it, it also affected how they did stuff up at Townhouse. Um, so that, that's the, the main reason. COVID did hamper us a little bit, but not a, not a ton. Um, I, I guess the looking forward, the, what we're gonna try to do is we need to work with the town uh, to kind of make sure that we had, don't have any issues as far as what we're posting on both systems. Uh, we also need to work with the software company because we've been trying to use the, the new software to actually process all of our bank reconciliations. And that's where a big problem was, is we're, we're not figuring that out. So for some, something's wrong with that, that's not working for us. So um, we're gonna work with them, we're gonna work with the town hall, and then also just, we just need to get on it and be more timely. So I've actually, before I was on, before this call, that's what I was working on. Okay. Um, just a quick question, hey, Matt. Um, I know we've talked about the new software several times and the comments actually been made that this software really is not ideal for municipalities. It's probably more appropriate for private utilities. Um, is that just a temporary stumbling block or do you see that there are some inherent problems with the software for us going forward? Well, I think it's a, it's a temporary, uh, we just need to get our, our feet under us, our, under our, uh, so, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's good. It's a good software system. It's, it's, uh, does all kinds of stuff that, that help our operations out. We went from handing stacks and stacks of paper every week to virtually paperless, mm -hmm. which you know, was great and more efficient. Oh, good questions. Um, any other comments from the board? All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zach and Matt. Um, very helpful. Um, thank you. So the next um, item is the annual work plan. And I'm not sure if Scott, you're addressing that or Carrie. Um, I, I, I probably can speak about it, but I, it probably is was more appropriate uh, coming from, from a town official. Uh, but I certainly um, and, and I'm more than welcome to, to throw my two cents in. All right. Uh, Carrie? So I think this is something that we take up at every meeting because the, this committee doesn't meet too frequently. So in the packet, there was a copy of the work plan that, that Wendy put together for us um, probably a couple of years ago now. And it's it's been very helpful and it, it identifies what tasks we should be working on and at what time. And um, we are certainly a little behind where we would normally be. We have not yet, the committee has not yet drafted up its letters on the three audits to go back to the select board and to the school committee. So that, that is an outstanding item. We need to draft up letters for the um, fiscal year 19 town audit, the district audit, and now the calendar year 19 light plant audit. So I would suggest that maybe we would want to have a meeting um, at, at some point in the next month. And Linda, a, as the chair, you and I work on those letters together. Okay. And, um, and we would 
draft that up, but it would be good for the committee probably to meet once just to review those so we could get back on track. And then Scott, really the other thing is just a status update with the fiscal 20 audits for the mm -hmm. district. Uh, yeah, thank you, Carrie. Um, the, the, the status report is it's probably a pretty, pretty short and sweet, but I, I think it's also some, some pretty good news. I, um, Carrie and Mary invited me to their um, standard meeting, I think it was last, last Friday, um, to just get a sense for exactly where, where the town was in its, in its closing process. And, and Mary indicated that um, she thought that by mid-October, I think that's what, essentially what she said, Mary, that uh, the town's general ledger would be closed. Um, and then final reports could be sent to us to, uh, to populate your, your, your CAFR or your comprehensive annual financial report um, and, um, and, and begin our audit procedures. Uh, Mary's has a nice long list of, of the information we, we, we need. Um, we've become, as I think everybody has, pretty adept at uh, uh, working remotely and, and, and Mary has the ability to upload uh, you know, all, essentially all required documentation uh, to, our, to our share file. Um, one, in the past, uh, one of the things that has, and I say the past, I'm talking about the last two, maybe three years that sort of has, has slowed down the process has been uh, the valuation of, of the town and the school district's OPEB liability. We've talked a little bit about that uh, already today. Uh, that is not expected to be a, uh, a, a stumbling block this year. Um, I did reach out to um, your actuary just to make sure things were, in, in, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in good working order. Haven't heard back from from him yet. I'm sure I will. Uh, but the town and the actuary, and we were a little bit involved in this conversation as well. But it certainly was a town decision, but one we fully support. Is that rather than having a complete new valuation process for June 30, 2020, the, the town and the school district are essentially going to use what is referred to as a, a roll forward procedure. Perfectly permissible under actuarial, actuarial standards and, and audit standards. It's essentially taking last year's data, rolling everything forward. Everybody's a year older, a year closer to retirement. Those types of calculations are made uh, and, and a new liability is projected based upon old data that simply rolled roll forward to the current, current time frame of June 30, 2020 significantly cuts down on the, the time requirement for, for an actuary to, to, to do and then the, the town to review the report. Um, so while that's been a stumbling block in, in getting things done in a, in, a, in a real timely manner in the past, it is not expected that that uh, situation will, will occur again uh, for this audit cycle. Uh, the other uh, major component of the audit that is already done is, is the audit of the the uh, Concrete Contributory Retirement System. Uh, that ha has a year end of 1231. So it's as of 1231-19. Uh, that audit has been fully executed and, and, and reports are available not only on the financial statements, but it's that report that essentially allocates the net pension liability to the town, to the school district, and to, and to CML, uh, CMLP. <clears throat> well, that's a big part of the, the, the engagement that's, that's already in, in, uh, been, been completed. So at this point, when, uh, when the town is able to close in a, in a couple of weeks and send us some trial balances, we're ready to go. Uh, we really are. And we're excited about the fact that the town is, uh, has elected to use these roll forward procedures. Uh, again, perfectly permissible under all standards. Hopefully it won't be getting... <laughs> If we won't be getting a valuation report in uh, the day after Thanksgiving and we've got an audit committee meeting because the committee wants to review drafts in early December. Uh, it kind of creates a little uh, co compression there. Uh, so that's just a quick overview of, of uh, our fiscal year 20 uh, engagements uh, for, the, for the town and, and the school district. <coughs> Scott, have you started field work for the district? I don't know if I if I missed that. Um, forgive me, you didn't miss it. I, I did not speak about it, uh, and I should have. Uh, we we have not. Uh, we we've done uh, preliminary procedures uh, there, but we've we've not uh, gone out and done done field work either on site or, or remotely. Uh, I think uh, that Ian is probably in a very similar 
a situation to, to Mary where uh, closing of the ledger is, is, is still occur occurring. Uh, oftentimes, I think it's usually closed by, um, you know, three months, the end of September, but uh, like all things right now, uh, things are you know, pushed back a month or so. so. So we should be, Scott, maybe planning on an audit committee meeting to see a draft of the fiscal 20 town audit in early December, pending getting the roll forward from the actuary. Uh, I, that's a great idea on, on, on your timeline uh, that I, I have here. You know, I sort of circled for both the town and the school district the, the month of November and December. And the timeline does call for, for the draft in, in, in uh, November and the finals in December. Uh, I know it's only early October, but uh, I, I think what we're realistically looking at is, is a draft in early December and then a finalization of, of that uh, by, by 1231. That's the target. The town hasn't, uh, the town hasn't uh, met that target in the last couple of years because of the OPEB situation. Uh, but that is, again, we need to hear from Larry, but uh, that is not expected to be the situation uh, this go around. So I think an early December uh, meeting of the committee to review the draft comprehensive annual financial report in our, in our management letter for the town. Uh, and then we will work to get that uh, finalized uh, by the end of the calendar year, because uh, particularly with a, at least one new member here, uh, the town does submit its financial statements to uh, uh, it's, it's called GFOA or the Government Finance Officers Association. You submit them and, and they review it to, um, and, and it's been awarded what is known as the highest form of uh, recognition in government financial reporting. It's called a Certificate of Achievement in, in Financial Reporting Excellence. Um, and that is required to be filed with them by the end, by, within six months of your year end. Linda, I think you may be muted. Thank you, Scott. Um, Carrie, do we need a meeting uh, early in November to um, finalize those letters with the committee? I think that would be a good idea. It would be likely be a very quick meeting, but, but those letters have typically come to the committee before they go to the select board and the school committee. So may I ask everyone if the uh, Tuesday at 8.30, November 10th, seems to work? Yep, works for me. Okay. Yep, works for me. Good. Tom? I, I can't tell, but as I mentioned before the meeting, I'm not sure I continue on the committee. I think my term is up. But I'll check on the 10th. All right. Um, so let's tentatively set it for 8.30 on November 10th. And as Carrie mentioned, this uh, should be a relatively short meeting so that we can finalize those letters. Okay. Would you like to tentatively identify a December date as well? I think that's a good idea. Okay. Um, I'm wondering how the 8th works. At 8.30, December 8th. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did not bring my phone in when I, when I switched rooms from my office to the conference room. I did not bring my phone in, but I'm very confident. Um, is, is December 8th a, a Tuesday? Yes. I, I would find it highly unusual if I have a commitment on, on that Tuesday morning at 8.30. So... If I do, I will let uh, Carrie know when we conclude this call. All right. Otherwise, let's, uh, at this point, for the rest of us, uh, note December 8th uh, at 8.30. Yep. All right. Um, I think we're ready to move on. Thanks to you, everyone, for that. Um, I think we are ready to move on to citizen comments. Are there any? I think our citizen left. All right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, thank you to um, Scott and Zach uh, for the presentations this morning and for everyone's participation uh, in the agenda. 
And I'm um, now uh, going to ask for a motion to adjourn. Before we do that, could I just I just really want to just <clears throat> quickly acknowledge the obvious and uh, welcome you, Linda, as our chair for um, for the Financial Audit Advisory Committee. Um, yes. You're our first leader since Mike, and I also wanted just to make sure that we all you know send out a thanks to Mike Lawson, who is you know who's completed his two terms um, very successfully on the board, and he was always a you know a, a real pleasure to have leading this, this committee, and we look forward to working with you too, Linda. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, both, uh, particularly the latter comment is uh, 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 appropriate. So thank you so much. Um, so now, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> Second. Okay, and again, we need to call the roll. <laughs> um, Piper. Uh, approve. Carol Wilson. Approve. Arthur Fullman. Approve. Wendy Ravelli. Approve. Linda Escobedo. Uh, approve. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.